enjoying this little peek into my life. Anyway, welcome back. Let's talk about the Pennsylvania, second to last period of the uh, Paleozoic era. Um, why does it never want to click? I, I don't think you understand how annoying that is to me. Anywho, can Pangea starting to come together? Um, we can see that uh, in evidence of these paleogeographic images. Um, what's going on in North America, starting to dry out greater depths. As we get into the Permian, it'll get even drier. Um, so we're in this latter part of the Carboniferous, so we're talking about Pennsylvania now. Again, we're going to start to get into some glaciation events, uh, some rise in oxygen. Uh, yeah, that, that may have some ramifications in the future. So, uh, in general, um, the, the Pennsylvanian rocks are distinguished from the Mississippian rocks because Mississippian rocks were shallow marine limestones. Pennsylvanian are more terrestrial in nature, swamps and further inland. Um, the, also during this time, the uplift of the continent, which resulted in the ancestral Rockies, which we talked about last unit, um, caused uh, uh, a more terrestrial environment during the Pennsylvania. There's just more more land abound coming up to, uh, coming out of the oceans as the, the seas regress. It's just more land. Swampy forests uh, become more common and widespread during this time. That becomes important for, for the production of coal, which we also talked about last year a little bit. Um, there's also sandstones shales, terrestrial in nature, um, more so here than in the Mississippi. What about the life in the Pennsylvania? Adaptations occurred in animals uh, and plants that allow for reproduction on dry land. That's important. We'll get to, to that in a little bit. We'll let's touch on a little bit right now, I guess. For plants, the adaptation was the further evolution of the seed. For animals, it was the amniotic egg a key feature in the origin of reptiles. Remember, up until this point, the most diverse, newest thing on land was the amphibians. They could live on land, but they had to go back to the water to reproduce. Um, amniotic eggs, the, the egg, is going to allow two animals to reproduce on land. Uh, in both cases, uh, these adaptations help to sedimentize to water, allowing for terrestrial habitation. Um, the vast amount of plant material now being created and dying in these swamps and forests of Pennsylvania would later aid in the formation of coal, which really characterizes the Pennsylvania period. And uh, insects with wings appeared. Um, some dragonflies of the time had wingspans of up to two and a half feet. So I'll uh, go back this much. It's a big dragonfly. And then cockroaches. Cockroaches were a foot long. Right. Cockroaches are a foot long. Compared to my face. Cockroaches are big. Mmm, delicious. Uh, millipedes, scorpions, spiders also proliferated in the forests. Again, during the Carboniferous, you know, this is kind of what we're, we're seeing, especially as we move into the Pennsylvania. Hey, there's some of those big uh, uh, dragonflies. Here's the, some of the first reptiles. We still have amphibians on land, um, but reptiles are starting to take hold. So again, the first reptiles appeared during the Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the earliest was kind of a lizard-like reptile, the uh, Hylonomus, which was very light, um, strong jaws, very slender. Um, so this evolution allowed vertebrates to reproduce on dry land for the first time with these amniotic eggs. More on that a little bit. The scaly skin of the reptiles helped to solve the problem of drying out on land, which amphibians still need water to moisten their skin, but scales seem to uh, prevent that, uh, even in intense heat. Um, 
there was also a change in orientation of legs. This change, so like whether legs off to the side or whether like legs underneath. So this change in locomotion uh, resulted in a more efficient running style, unlike the more waddly amphibians. Um, so this could have uh, been a reason reptiles proliferated more so than amphibians. Just change from their legs being off to the side to more so under them can make them a little bit faster. So here's kind of the, the first evidence of fossilized reptiles. Again, this little lizard-like thing. Um, again, my Latin's bad, the Hylonomus. Excuse me. It looks like a you know common everyday lizard that we might see now. Now, what helped uh, reptiles take hold was the egg. It was an egg evolution, an egg evolution. I laughed. Um, so this was a key feature uh, in the origin of reptiles, the development of this amniotic egg, which eliminated the uh, necessity for laying eggs in the water. So like in your modern day chicken egg, uh, this new type of egg had a durable shell for protection. What we now know as the whites of the egg, it's clear when it comes out, white when we cook it, the white part uh, of the amniotic egg helps to prevent um, drying while still promoting air to reach the embryo inside the egg. Good things are going on in the background. The yellow part of what we know the egg, the yolky part, uh, help to provide nutrition for the growing embryo inside the egg, uh, which the yolky part reduces in size as the embryo matures. It's kind of like it's nutrition, it's food source, so that slowly goes away. Also, in these newly evolved eggs, you get these fluid-filled sacs, which permitted the embryo to survive. One sac contained the embryo in a stable fluid environment. Another sac provided for uh, waste gas and uh, solid waste, you know, excrement from the embryo to, uh, to go somewhere. So again, yeah, we have the protective shell, we have kind of the, the whites uh, <coughs> providing that fluid protection, the, the yolk, which had these couple of extra uh, sacs in it, um, one for nutrition, one for waste. So the evolution of this, which reptiles were able to, to use in reproduction, is what helped to um, move organisms onto land initially. Also during the Pennsylvanian is the proliferation of not only forests, but swampy forests. So we have proliferation of plants and trees uh, on land, and uh, you know, plants, just like plants and animals, they both first, you know, when they first made their way onto land, it took time for them to evolve inland. Um, so that's kind of where things kind of first were. So true forests were kind of developed in these lowland, swampy coastal sites. And uh, lycophytes were the, the tallest plants at the time, reaching heights of up to 100 feet, producing large amounts of plant biomass which would eventually become whole. I'm talking about plant biomass, talking about any leaves, twigs, sticks, dead trees and plants falling, dying, decaying, building up. This is what eventually would make coal. We talked about that last unit. Horsetails, another group of plants that reach heights. Uh, ferns were also prolific during this time. Uh, so you get all these different types of plants and trees that are providing the biomass when these things die and build up to eventually form these cold, like cold layers. Early conifers, cone-bearing trees, first make their appearance. Um, the descendants of these trees, things like fir, pine, redwood, and spruce trees are what we have today, but so conifers, cone-bearing trees, things that have pine cones, for instance, uh, first make their appearance here. Here's what some of those swampy forests might have looked like. Very unique trees but there's still plant life nonetheless. So how did we get from that to coal beds? The coal beds of Pennsylvania proper are about 40 feet thick. Um, there are other coal beds related to younger time period, the Paleocene age beds in North Dakota that are over a thousand feet thick, 
but tied to this time with Pennsylvania during the Paleozoic era. We have these coal beds now in Pennsylvania that are 40 feet thick. Coal beds reflect that transgressive, regressive cycle of those cyclothems we talked about last unit. Um, the way coal forms, plants die, which um, kind of fall into these swampy waters. That organic material uh, builds up and uh, eventually makes coal. Um, that organic material didn't completely decay away. First, it becomes something called peat, which is kind of this organic brown, mushy stuff, which is a mix of twigs, roots, other plant parts. Um, when a transgressive event further covered these swamps with sediment, um, it covered the peat, and the peat was, uh, with a little bit of heat and pressure of the overlying sediments, changed to lignite, which if there's more heat and pressure via more sediment that turned to bituminous coal, and if there was even more heat and pressure that turned to anthracitic coal. So the coal beds at this time kind of are in this region of the, the south and uh, the east and, and the midwest part of the United States. Um, there are six major coal beds throughout this region, and this is when people think of coal or coal country. This is, you know, miners mining out coal down in the coal mines. They're typically talking about Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, these sorts of areas. Um, this is an example of, well, let me go back here. So here you see a, kind of a coal bed uh, in between sedimentary layers. Just for reference, this is a, a, one of those coal beds over there in North Dakota. You can see how big of a difference these are. Uh, those came at a different time period, a different era. So, um, yeah, that, these swamps and eventually coal that formed kind of typify the end of the Carboniferous in the Pennsylvanian period. And so as we come out of that, we're going to get into the Permian. That's going to end our discussion on life in the Paleozoic. Uh, but you know what? Before we do, let me give you another part of the super secret code. It is the capital letter B, as in Bravo. The capital letter B, as in Bravo. I'm on a letter kick today. I don't know why. Um, so yeah, so let's go ahead and pause here. When we come back, let's talk about the Permian.